Thank you. Hello, everybody. The talk of today is about, well, you, you recognize these pictures. That was uh, the Beatles in the, in the old days. Uh, this is because uh, the idea of, uh, of even storming, the reason why here was uh, apparently simple, like uh, put all the key people in the same room, and then, yeah, something magic will happen. Like, uh, Suddenly, people will start moving stuff, doing things, and uh, well, suddenly there's a moment where I will start moving things and challenge, uh, challenge something. And that's about, uh, yeah, the, uh, the more, I would say, spectacular part of, uh, part of even storming, which is, uh, yeah, the big picture. When, uh, yeah, the, the thing that you can see is just like, uh, it's a massive discovery, chaotic parallel collaboration. We end up to discover a progressive emergent structure learning is conquered together in a, in a very special day. And uh, I love this part. I mean, this part is actually really, really great for me because it's uh, really unexpected by the people. Magic is actually happening, and uh, well, I was a good ingredient for it. That makes a great day. So, but it's also weird because it's a very, very chaotic experience. A lot of people doing stuff together, sometimes talking, sometimes not talking. The thing is completely under control. So, uh, the given moment, I call myself uh, uh, the cow summoner. And this created some problems in, uh, yeah, here in the Netherlands and in Belgium because of my pronunciation. So, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's a very weird uh, uh, activity that gets to a discovery of the, of the domain. But when, doing, when practicing software modeling with, uh, with other colleagues in, in a smaller scale, well, we have to face uh, this, uh, this little problem, well, that the definition of software design is actually different. It's, it cannot be chaotic by definition. So some of the expectations, some of the dynamics that happens in the big picture cannot be replicated in a small scale, or they have to be really, really different. There's also another problem here. It actually has to do with uh, my personal biases. So the real problem which is on the stage is, is actually me. So, it, one of the things that I didn't realize was uh, how much I was perturbing my experiments myself. So, in the last two or three years, I've basically never been in a room where I, where I was not actively participating to an event storming modeling. I, I was there, so people were asking me to do stuff, to participate, or I was facilitating, trying to do little, but I was, uh, yeah, I was the, the Heisenberg principle in action, just like uh, I couldn't see reality without me. So, or, or I started some reality show, like, uh, yeah, Spice in the restaurant, or I don't even know if the, the, name, is, uh, the name is correct, uh, or, well, I, I need to see something in, uh, in some other way. But then I start to get curious about what was actually my influence about the modeling that I was uh, uh, facilitating or not. And uh, even on the other side, it was, uh, there was something that I thought it was not supposed to be part of the recipe, but then it should. And this is where we're going to head. But in practice, just uh, when we talk about software design, we are talking about a convergent activity in theory, disagreements need to be resolved. You don't want to put disagreements in the software while accepting some special condition, but I will need the beer to talk about it. Uh, when uh, you have two uh, stakeholders continuously fighting, you just put this in the configuration. That's another stuff. Uh, we need precision, and precision actually takes time. So in a, in a, you cannot get uh, precision when you have 30 people involved. Uh, this Mass is part of the game, but you cannot live with this mass up to the software. And uh, then there's also this, uh, this thing, like uh, even in the domain-driven design community, well, we think we agree what, what the aggregates are, and it's fine to agree about them in a, in a mailing list, in a discussion, and then when we get into software, oh, well, well, but no, this is not an aggregate, and you get it only when you're just at the very last mile. Looks like everybody agrees because we don't like to get into conflict, but when you have to write those lines of code, okay, this fits in this box or not. In general, the thing is, uh, 
reaching an agreement. That's the thing that it's, uh, it's really hard. Just like uh, in order to reach an agreement, both parties need to express what they think of. And both parties also need to understand what the other party is saying. And uh, we need to find a solution. And the solution needs to be understood, and the solution needs to be accepted. That's a very complicated process. So I like to say, like, uh, yeah, reaching an agreement is a very demanding form of communication. So sometimes you even get shortcuts just because of this. Well, we're not reaching an agreement. You do as I say. That's faster. It takes a lot of energy. And this, is, this was one of the dynamics that uh, put me in a weird uh, situation, like, uh, yes, I had this big deja vu feeling that was something that was uh, coming from, uh, from my past. And, uh, yeah, and I have to yeah, think about it and maybe recover some idea from a uh, yeah, very, very long time ago. So I'm going to restart this talk. I would like to talk about uh, what happens in this type of situation when we have uh, yeah, four competing brains in, in the room. And so I have to start again with my presentation, which is, uh, yeah, that's something about me. That's what you probably know, just like uh, uh, for somebody's even storming, for somebody's just domain-driven design, for somebody's uh, about the bullshit asymmetry principle and all, all this stuff that keeps me aligned on the web on every discussion about almost everything. Uh, but there's something that you don't know, which is uh, me in the 80s, and no pictures about me, that's a good thing. And, uh, and I wanted to be a drummer. I still play drums. And I was making experiments uh, in songwriting with uh, yeah, electronic stuff like uh, Yamaha DX7. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was trying to get into songwriting. If you remember the 80s, that was uh, yeah, the time of Nick Kershaw, um, um, Howard Jones. I mean, there's so, so many weird stuff at this time. So, what I really wanted to say and confess today, that my greatest contribution to the community, and probably to the world in general, is, is, not, is not even storming, is the fact that I quit songwriting. So you never heard any <laughs> single song that I wrote at that time. And everybody should be really grateful about it. And uh, still, I had a lot of, lot of stuff to, to learn from that time. And uh, because it was... Uh, it was interesting, it was fun, it was challenging, it was uh, psychologically demanding to be in, in the same room, making noise with some friends, making something that was incredibly beautiful for a, for a moment, and then you listen to it, and then, oh, actually, this was crap. Uh, but the process was really, really interesting. So I would like to use this, this metaphor to take a closer look of what happens when you put many different brains in the same room. And I would like to look first at what happens when, uh, in, uh, to the process of, uh, of writing. So if, uh, I put some samples about the famous bands. And uh, so if you think about the Beatles, I uh, might say like uh, Lennon versus McCartney were the two biggest brains, especially at the beginning, with a strong dualism. Then George Harrison was slowly emerging, and that was creating conflict later on. And it looks like Ringo Starr was more or less uh, the peacemaker, the scrum master of the, of, of the band in some way. Uh, well, the Queen... Oh, well, that we have Bohemian Rhapsody. When I first wrote this talk, Bohemian Rhapsody was not uh, um, out yet, so now, now everybody has, is listening again uh, to, to the to Queen uh, a lot more. And, uh, well... Everybody was a songwriter in different moments, well, with strong personalities, but uh, looks like they, find, they managed to find some equilibrium. But, uh, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. The Oasis were a lot more interesting. So it was a continuous fight between the two brothers, a lot of uh, beer, a lot of fights, a lot of discussion, then they broke up and they started uh, writing more or less the same type of song. Weird stuff, they just hated each other. Uh, the police, uh, Sting was a very strong personality, so were the other two, but in songwriting, it looks, looks like it was a lot more, uh, yeah, um, productive. And on the other edge of the spectrum, it was, uh, for me, it was uh, Lenny Kravitz. When I, when I first heard about Lenny Kravitz, who, and I was reading the credits in the, in the first record, 
There were no credits. He was playing every single instrument, guitar, bass, saxophone, and, uh, and, uh, and drums, uh, and just uh, uh, over-recording everything. Uh, Foo Fighters, just uh, Dave Grohl starting from uh, uh, playing drums in Nirvana, then leading a band, playing guitar, and then keep uh, playing drums in some other band that looks like having fun everywhere. So the, there's, is there a common trait? Actually, the common trait is there is not a common trait. Every single band has to define their own process. Some bands and some songs started like jamming, and some other songs started like uh, a single person being along for a long time and then coming back, I have this song, it's a masterpiece, or I have this song, it's a masterpiece, and get, get destroyed by the other member of the team, of the band, and, uh, and then you, you have something which turns out like a true masterpiece and a lot of bad songs dropped in the process. So, this is one thing that was really interesting for me from, uh, from the rock band's domain. And uh, it just allowed us not to have anything like this, become a certified rock songwriter. Uh, talking about music, now what is happening, especially in the, yeah, in the industrial part of the music, uh, is, uh, is way different. If you get into pop, there's a lot more scientific Darwinian process about tunes uh, uh, and uh, little melodies and something that could be a hit and, and so on. But the, the wild exploration that happened in, in the bands is actually not, not, so, not so common anymore. But the other thing that was part of the game is the fact that, yes, personalities and habits and uh, yeah, even addictions uh, were shaping the process. So. Um, it's about what happens when you put the people together, when you create the alchemy. And it's also interesting because it, the same problem, this, this little thing that is written here, like most music school, fair individual mastery, this, the rest is up to you, is exactly the same problem we have in, in writing software. University, universities help to a given extent to be a good programmer to be able to decompose problem, to see the, the algorithm, but the collaboration, well, there is not so much help in understanding what needs to be good in a collaboration. There's also another thing which is interesting uh, for me uh, from the music domain, that there is creativity applied on top of a fixed uh, uh, structure, like intro, verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, uh, bridge, verse, chorus, or something like this. So you have a repeatable structure that helps you to get a feeling of, OK, this sounds like a good song, this sounds like a potential hit, uh, but uh, also you can have uh, variations. So this is uh, Led Zeppelin performing Stairway to Heaven. And uh, yes, again, if you think about Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody was actually uh, seen as a potential problem because it was not, was not following the structure. You're not using the three standard layers, we might say, in architecture. So uh, if I want to make a little summary from, uh, from me as a drummer seat, um, Songwriting was a little bit of a, well, actually it was a lot of fun. It was a playground. I, I wrote a lot of crap, and, uh, but still it was funny. It was, it was really great to be playing with this stuff, seeing this song that was starting to emerge, and then uh, seeing the magic of putting, putting different things uh, together. At the same time, when playing with, uh, with some friends, it was a battleground. It was a continuous fight, like, oh, you should, you should just make, a, make an easy beat here. Well, I would like to make something that can show off a little bit more. No, you should just like play something simple that was really, really boring for me. And uh, the great place was uh, how taking somebody else's idea, adding something special that were not, they were not thinking of, and then making it really, really great. And the final thing is, uh, Whose song is this one? Especially if the song becomes great. Oh, I had the original idea, but uh, the original idea was weak without a given beat or without a, a given riff or a, or a background chorus. Or you, you basically lose paternity, and, and that is great. And just like the result is way better than the contribution. Okay. If you, if you were a music fan in the 80s or in the 90s, that's great, but we are here for software. So let's talk about software. But the first picture is not yet about software. So can you spot the problem here? 
I will hint you, the problem here has to do with, uh, with diversity. Everybody's playing strings. There's not a single drum, not a single trumpet. Well, you're looking at the other stuff. Now, it's, uh, talking about modeling, the thing about event storming and uh, every other collaborative modeling activity is uh, you cannot start only with a given mindset. So when, when doing, even when doing small-scale uh, modeling around the given feature, I need diversity in the room. And I think you need diversity in the room too. I did, well, maybe backend development. Front-end development brings a different uh, type of attention, but at the same time, business analyst knows the stuff from a different perspective, user experience expert, product owner, and another expert which is not the product owner. Everybody's bringing a different contribution. Everybody's playing a different instrument. And sometimes they have to play together, sometimes they have to be quiet, but a great song is made by the contribution of m uh, many different people. Um, which means, like, uh, yes, that's the thing that I would like to say. Some, uh, the users are not interested in maintainability, that's our problem. And uh, so we need the contribution. The flip side of the contribution is just like, we have to be aware that everybody's having blind spot. A single person could not hold the whole story. And uh, so we need the collaboration in order to have the large-scale understanding. The other thing is, uh, yeah, uh, cross-discipline, which means if I can only play drums, I could never ever understand exactly what the guitar player is asking me to. I'm not a good guitar player. I'm not even a good drum player, but well, I've been playing drums for 35 years now, so... Um, yeah, I still can do something. But understanding something from the other person's perspective, it helps me to understand that he's not a bastard. He wants me to play the simple bit right here, because otherwise he's going to be lost at the end of the solo. So that's some understanding the other perspective really, really helps. It's a matter of respect and so on. And uh, yeah, so that, that's something that might be interesting. There's another thing which is uh, really tied to the music background, and it's, uh, and it's probably the biggest theme here. So I would like to talk about what I call the illusion of incremental modeling. This is something that's so in action in many, many sessions. Like, uh, we start, we start building something, we pick another requirement, the thing is growing, and uh, yes, it's growing till we're finished. And I probably was contributing to this, uh, to this idea because, uh, yes, it ends with you when, you, when you're happy. But I realized that my definition of happy was not exactly the other definition, the, the other people's definition of happy, or maybe it just was overlapping with the definition of uh, exhausted. And just like, I'm not happy, but it's 6 o'clock, please, Alberto, I want to go home. And, uh, and so that's, that's how you reach a, a trade-off sometimes. So part of this illusion is just like, uh, you just add your own track. And uh, this is what happens when, uh, when, you, when you have uh, uh, user experience and front-end development and back-end development working together. It's just like, uh, oh, yes, I'm going to give you the wireframes, and you're going to do your job. And, or I just, uh, well, these are the pages. Just put some good CSS and make it beautiful, the, this, this type of thing. It, it, it's not exactly working like this. It should not work like this. The second illusion, when uh, when modeling this is, uh, yeah, Yagni, you ain't going to need it. And, uh, well, this is one of those recommendations that is good sometimes, but it's not good every time. And uh, I need to clarify, even if it's just like uh, redundant in a conference like this, that uh, we are not modeling anywhere. We are domain-driven design, we're supposed to be modeling on the core, and, uh, well, maybe that's exactly the place where you might need this thing. Or you just might need to be mentally prepared to this thing to see how the model is going to react. And so every, every time I, I, I get into a modeling session, there's still this voice saying, like, oh, yeah, but we don't need this. We don't need this. Too, too early for this. And uh, we try to end up with a model which is really, really simple. We'll explain it a little bit more later. But that's, that's part of the, of the problem. Another big enemy in this area is uh, sunken cost. Well, sunken cost is a fallacy, just like uh, the perception that uh, 
the value, you're basically overestimating the value of what you think you're losing. And so you, you get an attachment which is more than the rational one to, to something uh, that, uh, that you don't want to lose. Oh, what if we, we have to rewrite everything? Well, maybe it's going to take you 10 minutes, but uh, you think it's going to take you half an hour or one hour or uh, ages. And this is happening all the time. This is happening with, the, with software. Also, in estimation, you usually tend to uh, underestimate new development uh, because your, yeah, your trust for the future is great. But uh, at the same time, I found a lot of developers te that tended to overestimate refactoring uh, because uh, or rewriting. It's like, uh, it took us four months to finish this. Uh, I don't want to spend another four months rewriting it. And the point is, well, it took you four months because you didn't know what you were doing. Now we know, and probably we can rewrite the whole stuff in, in two weeks instead of four months, because we have the knowledge. But the brain is thinking like, oh, not another four months, please. So this is happening. Everybody is suffering from sunken cost fallacy, and, it, and it's part of the game. But the thing that this phenomenon is happening also during modeling session, when you just wrote something on a sticky note, so your sunken cost is actually 2.3 seconds and uh, one sticky note, but you don't want to uh, take the, this idea away. You don't want to rewrite names. You don't want to find another name for a, for a potential aggregate or for an event. And, uh, and it's, it sounds really, really stupid, but it's happening. And uh, well, that's okay, even if we are rational based. And there's been a lot of talk today uh, also about uh, yeah, Daniel Kahneman and uh, System 1, System 2. Yes, it is stupid. Yes, we will keep doing it. Uh, even if we are smart programmers, really good professionals, we are going to be stupid. We cannot be 24 hours per day smart. And all of this discussion will be a long series of yeah, brilliant intuition and little stupid decision, including, oh, should I really rewrite this one? I'm so lazy to rewrite some stuff. It's part of the game. Accept it. You cannot change it. And uh, yes, a single aggregate name but might be enough to make you feel, oh, I don't want to write it. You're not going to say it explicitly, because then you're going to sound stupid, and then that's something that you, want, you don't want to do. But uh, your brain is going to think like that. So, I've been talking a lot. Really, what I wanted to say is this one. Collaborative modeling is not an incremental work. It's not like, oh, we, have the, we added an event, and then we have the policy, then we have this. Yes, that's the way we shape the discussion, but it's not going to be an incremental process. You don't write a song by just like start with, with, the, uh, with the drum, and then add the bass, and then add the guitar, add the voice. Finished. Oh, yes. Well, how much time was this? Yeah, 30 minutes we wrote a song. That's not the way it works. So, the real thing is, in order to build a model, we need to drop the not-so-good ones, and not the not-so-good songwriters like me also. So, it's, it's a little step that moves from uh, traditional modeling getting into Darwinian space, where you don't want to have only one idea, where you want to have many ideas available so that you can choose between. So after the, the basic steps of understanding the mechanics and the notation and the, the meaning of the different uh, uh, building blocks for, uh, for a modeling session, well, be it even storming or, or some other way, then you can do something a, a little more interesting, which is uh, trying to accelerate the Darwinian selection. And uh, trying to do something like uh, not focusing the discussion of we have to finish this. No, it's not about finishing. It's about getting to a place that it sounds right. So some ideas can be stolen from, uh, from game storming, uh, which might be, yeah, you might want to split and merge in a given moment. You might want to have, uh, OK, do we understand the basic? OK, now the two teams are trying to model the same thing, and then we can merge. Some parts are going to look exactly the same. Some others are not. And, uh, but then we might choose different options. Or uh, uh, we had some uh, good experience in some workshop, just like uh, splitting two teams and then adding a target. The first team completing the flow gets, uh, gets free beer from the other team. And they started modeling like, uh, like hell. Um, in, 
some other session, the idea was to have a marketplace. So I'm modeling a portion of the flow, and I need this event from you. Can you please deliver this event from me? And there was negotiation on the contract. So the APIs were emerging in a modeling marketplace. Or another idea, actually, I got it from uh, Dave Snowden uh, two, uh, two days ago. You might want to split the groups and, and have uh, a, a, represent, uh, a speaker person from one group being the ambassador in another uh, modeling session, and then try to improve somebody's model. Or you can even just leave the model on the wall, and the second uh, team is going to try to understand it and improve it. There are so many things that you can play, but if you are always the same people in the same room, it's just like uh, um, that's only one option, not the only one. So there's a wide range of possibility here. I call, yeah, Mike want to call it collaborative modeling toolkit. There's, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. I'll change the topic. There's something here that has to do also with, uh, with the structure, little thing that started to emerge during the discussion, uh, like uh, in songwriting, introduction, verse, and, and so on. One of the things that uh, it was, uh, wasn't exactly easy to grasp at the beginning, and uh, maybe I didn't, didn't make it so clear, it's just like uh, there's an implicit symmetry in the thing that we are doing. And, uh, and it's also given a good feedback of, uh, OK, now it looks OK. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a modeling session. Oh, actually, this is a process modeling session in action. We don't have the aggregates yet. But uh, you can see that there is some, uh, some symmetry here. Like uh, this is uh, pink, and then we have lilac uh, producing commands here. We have another round of uh, external system with, uh, with uh, uh, emitting command, uh, policies, emitting commands to external system, uh, publishing events. Uh, listen to other policies and uh, and so on. You, there is a cadence. There is also a, a squ square, rectangle, square, rectangle, square, rectangle type of type of thing, which is telling me I don't know if the model is good because I'm not reading everything, but it's more or less consistent. There are no gaps. There's nothing missing in this. So the only thing I can say, just like I don't know if it is good, but looks good. Not a guarantee for success, but it, I would say if you don't respect this, it's actually guaranteed that there's something wrong. Another thing you might want to look at, that's so obvious, is uh, there might be verbal symmetry, like open subscription, subscription as a candidate aggregate in between, and subscription opened. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds like, oh, that might be. So the, the thing in the middle might be the subscription. The underlying problem here is when it looks so obvious, People get pissed off, do we really need to model this? Because we want the problem to be yeah, um, aligned with our uh, intellectual capabilities. If the problem is too small, we feel slightly insulted. So is that even storming? Oh, well, I'm better than this. But it's part of the game. So not every problem is challenging enough for your brain. Not every bit is cool enough for your uh, playing abilities. Same stuff. Um, some tricks here that might help. Just like uh, I'm usually scanning the, the model for a complementary action. Everything that gets open should be closed some way. Uh, everything that, that, that is started should be stopped. There might be re uh, reversible action. And uh, I didn't say create, delete, because I hate it. But uh, yeah, yeah, you get the point. I'm looking actually for state machine behavior. So there's something which is changing state along the way. And maybe it's one thing, maybe it's two, and we got to look at it. And then the traditional role and responsibility, and everything that you get in your backpack, like tooling from good OP modeling, they are still there. I just added colors, so nothing, nothing new here. With a little warning, which is this one, it's very easy to spot symmetry in the middle of the flow, you might not have symmetry at the edges or not the way you want it. Usually you have a, a user language from the beginning to the very end, and then you have a valley of technical language in between crossing a different bounded context. Um, but that's another thing that happens. Sorry, I need to go back. Something that I can do only here. Yeah. There's something that happens in this modeling session, which is really interesting for me. Everybody's obsessed with the language. Everybody thinks they are doing domain-driven design, so we should listen to the language, but they don't. 
They just uh, want to see something. They just want to finish the modeling, and that might be part of the gamification sometime, or the implicit gamification, but they don't realize about, uh, about what they are actually saying or not saying. So, my suggestion in this type of situation is actually weird. I like to call it uh, sound stupid. Which is, uh, if you say, if you announce, if you declare your model uh, to the rest of the team, this is going to be your safety net. Because everybody hates sounding stupid in front of an audience, and this is going to be your safety net trying to correct, no, that's not exactly what I meant. So when the moment you start correcting yourself because you don't want to sound stupid in front of an audience, your brain is try trying to save you from your, uh, from your problem. This is actually something that uh, I learned many years ago from, uh, from Eric, just model out loud, just uh, don't just read it, say it. It just, uh, what, what I discovered, what I practice, is just like uh, actually this little truth. Like, it is easier to fool yourself if you don't listen to yourself. If you just point finger and say like, mm -hmm, yes, it, it makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. Then you try to say it loud in front of an audience. Uh, well, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> Use it. Force people to talk. Give them, put them in this situation. I could accept a lot of things between me and myself, but here, in front of an audience, I need to, yeah, weight every single word carefully. So you have no idea about the crap I'm not saying, but uh, yeah. There's, there's, there's an extra effort in the brain, and this is helping to validate your model. At the same time, and this is getting contradictory, this is creating extra tension, so you need to find ways to, yeah, one, two, three, four, and start playing. Start fleshing out something and have teams starting to model. Like at the very, very moment we, we, we have already an idea about what is the piece of, of, of the process we need to model, so how do we start? Everybody start looking at, at somebody else. Again, a big picture, you just need the, the icebreaker, but, uh, but when in a small scale, the thing is we are trying to reach a solution together, and uh, uh, people are trying to solve everything, but they cannot solve everything, so they just don't do anything. So, in practice, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, blocker when doing this session is uh, choices, is alternatives. And uh, the, first, the, the best uh, solution I found to this, uh, to this problem, if you find anything better, I'm welcome to suggest it, but that's my, my current uh, state of the art, is uh, don't, don't try to solve everything at the same time. Every time you get into a bifurcation, every time you get into an alternative, uh, pick one and just make the other one visible. What is your best friend? This, uh, this purple sticky note, or magenta. And uh, so, we're, ah, what about bitcoins? We're not considering bitcoins. So everything that you're not picking gets visible and, uh, and not solved now, next round. So I, I call this approach uh, uh, rush to the goal. So the idea is to start from, uh, from something yeah, here at the beginning, what, what we need flesh out this thing as quick as possible, and, uh, and then uh, eventually add the, the, the red markers uh, about uh, the thing that you don't, uh, don't like. But uh, get to a working solution as soon as possible. It doesn't have to be good, it just has to be one. And then pick the alternatives when, when you want to finish. That is part of, uh, I would say, broader principle that, uh, again, I thought it was, uh, it was obvious, but it was not, so I started adding it as a, as a modeling principle. And it's uh, this one. I call it also no religion worse, but uh, it's uh, only talk about visible things. So the way people get stuck is, uh, you can see it in the, in, in the body language, is uh, sometimes you're modeling on the wall, sometimes on the table, but you're doing stuff, and then you're talking about stuff you can't touch, and then suddenly you just uh, move away, and then, oh, but if, in this scenario, in this scenario, then you start getting into conversation without visual support. And then you're talking about something which is not visible, and then there is no way to end this conversation. So the only way to manage this conversation is to enforce, this is probably the only real rule of even storming, is you only talk about visible things. 
So if something is not visible, you're not allowed to, to talk about it, which means well, there is an easy solution if you want to talk about something. You just write a sticky note and you put it on the wall. Now I can talk about it, but at least there's something that, you, that we might see. Or if you are comparing two solutions, okay, flesh out the other solution, and then we are comparing the two solutions. It's not like, but if in this case we do this, and in this case we do this, and then you start looking somewhere else. Everything visible, then we can discuss. You cannot say thank me thank for, for this one, because it's a little trick, game changer. Some little other um, helps. This is actually little, but uh, let's see. Uh, I like to talk about life cycle heuristics. <laughs> and uh, whenever you're modeling along a timeline, you might see like there are things that are lasting for, for different things. This might help in, uh, in picking uh, which one might be the good, uh, the good aggregates for, uh, for a given thing. So I picked this example from, uh, we were modeling um, uh, a train, uh, train system. So uh, you might have a competing, competing life cycle here. This might be uh, the first one is, uh, is the train. And the train is living for, uh, for many years, in Italy for generations. And uh, a ticket might be living from the moment you buy it to the moment you use it. It might, might, might be six months. And the purchase, well, should be done in minutes, hopefully. The trip should be hours. That's another thing that in Italy is not guaranteed. And, uh, but the whole journey of the train might be, might be different, or it might be composed by different uh, trips on different trains. At the same time, here you have the life cycle of a timetable that might be valid for a season, for a year, or for uh, yeah, ages. So visualizing the different, different times on, on the same scale, just telling something like, oh, these are different things. Sometimes uh, it's very obvious to realize that those things are uh, not the same thing, uh, but sometimes you're just visualizing the time, and uh, no, these are changing on different scales for different reasons. It helps. This has something to do with uh, how do we solve conflicts. So another problem uh, when doing this, uh, this modeling session is uh, people want to win an argument. They want to be the, well, usually every single developer wants to be the smartest developer in the room. It's just like, it, it's part of it. I mean, we descend from monkeys and, and it's uh, uh, no way out. It, 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 it has to be it. We, we just can uh, mitigate the risk. But the situation where that we get into when we start modeling something, it's just like we might have two competing models and they both look okay. It's clear, we just don't have enough information to pick the winner. But if we discuss about it now, that discussion is gonna be endless. Oh, because uh, in this situation, not visible, but because of this. So whenever you have two yeah, valid models and two people fighting for the different ideas, okay, let's raise the bar. It's just like uh, if you wanna make selection of, of a car, I mean, uh, uh, a 500 or a Lamborghini, and if you just have to park them in, uh, in front of a grocery store, well, there's not so much difference, but if you have to go on a track, or if you have to go in the center of an Italian city, well, that, that is making the difference. But if you test them in a parking lot, that doesn't make much difference. So the parking lot is easy, uh, get, you need to get to the edge. So I like to call this raise the bar, which is uh, on a simple scenario, two models can be, yeah, more or less the same. And that's a situation where this discussion don't stop because you don't have a clear winner, so it's just a personality clash. Um, we need that condition to have a clear winner and don't discuss now. Now, I'm assuming we get to the, to the moment where uh, it's probably five o'clock, maybe even later. We, we got everything sorted out. We got, uh, we got the process which is completed. We have uh, the users which are happy. Uh, um, the, the passenger has a ticket. The controller has the list of the passengers so we could check uh, the, the tickets and so on. And, this, and the whole process, the whole transaction is, uh, is complete and looks like uh, everything is working so we can uh, go home safely. And to me, this is where the things are starting to get interesting, because it feels like, OK, now everybody learned how to play the song. Uh, they learned the charts. We're not making the mistakes. And it started to, to, uh, to sound OK. 
And this is where uh, we can start to do something different, like uh, can you make a ragged version of, you, of this song? You know you can play it rock, and you have a rock version. Can you make it ragged? Can you make it lounge? I mean, it's the same song, but you change something so it sounds like, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit of uh, percussions also in, in the background or something to play uh, on the beach. Can I make it ska? It just, uh, yeah, make it faster, a little bit more, uh, more bumpy. If you can stretch your model in different conditions, it means like, oh, well, well we tested something, something different. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you can really understand which are the, the, the greatness, uh, the, the strong parts and the weak parts of your song, which, uh, which one might give, you, might give you an edge. Okay, let's get back to software. What does it mean to play variations? Is uh, what I meant before, like people don't actually listen to themselves. Just uh, try to collect terms during the conversation, pick something that, uh, that is not uh, yet in the model and try to add it. So you might use new terms instead of the one that we're just using or together. Um, given numbers, one of, one of the most shocking experiments, we had the one team doing an exercise. They were talking about 11 different entities. They were solving the model only with two. And uh, well, from 11 to two is a little bit too much of keep it simple, stupid. It really sounded like there was something missing, too much Darwinian selection in this, uh, in this case. So, the bias which is in place, people will try to solve the problem with the smallest possible number of moving parts. So what's heur heuristics for me? Just this one, add moving parts. We solved everything with two aggregates, let's try it with three, or with four. So, this, this is a number, this number is something, is a statistics that I'm, that I'm collecting, which is uh, from most of the critical modeling session that we had around the, around the bottlenecks, and it's exactly the number of times where the solution was uh, less classes, remove aggregates. So the thing that was uh, striking many, many times is just like uh, critical bottlenecks in, uh, in legacy systems, the one that were clogging the organization where most of the time not the result of too many different classes was uh, but it was too little everybody was trying to keep it simple keep it simple that was the bad the good practice applied scientifically and turned out to be a trap so i'm not saying this is a general principle i'm saying that here in the bottleneck that that used to be most of the time uh, uh, part of the problem. So, in general, is uh, what if we have an order and a purchase, like two separate entities? What if we have a user and an employee, and they are not the same thing? You're not really saving stuff by putting things together. You're creating coupling that uh, you don't need to have. Uh, more explicitly, I need to clarify this. What I told it, but let's put it in a slide. We are in the core domain. It's not a general principle. We are in the core domain, and if you're doing this after a like, big picture even storming session, we are in a place where smart people already try to apply a solution following good practices that didn't work. So we need to try something different. That's a space where we can try everything. If you just try to play it exactly the way it was played, you're probably going to get exactly into the same solution you had before that didn't work only with more sticky notes. Another variation, let's raise the bar in our modeling tricks. And, uh, and this is another thing that was uh, surprising. So if you really want to be a rock star in modeling, that's, that's one thing that you have to do to be a rock star, which is, any idea? Smash your guitar, which in musician terms, it means like, uh, destroy your model. It was actually something that was picked up uh, even uh, in the, the talk uh, from Evelyn uh, right before me. And it was something surprising. So the story goes like this. Uh, we were running a session. I was leaving the participant uh, modeling uh, the stuff during, it was actually a class, an exercise, and they were stuck. They were trying to model everything at the same time, and, uh, and they were not uh, moving. So I said, like, okay, let's... Uh, 
let me help you a second, let me see if I can do something for you. So I started, yeah, putting put a blue thing, and then a yellow, and then an orange, and then putting a lilac, write, writing some name for the lilac, getting another blue, and something. And then uh, one of the participants was, was an old friend and told me, oh, well, you're doing that quick because you already know the solution. And I looked at him like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And he was shocked because he was, uh, I mean, for me it was harder to remember the solution than create another solution on the fly. And the other thing, I was absolutely not in love with my solution. I was not expecting my solution to be good. It was just the solution. I just needed to have something visible. And the thing that was shocking them, after I flashed something, I started destroying my model. I say, well, now this sucks here, here, and here. I started adding red stuff, like uh, everything I, I've done was actually horrible. And they were shocked in re realizing that I was actually insulting my own model. I had no pride in my, in my model. I just thought, uh, oh, so, so, so we can say something about it. Of course, it's not good. I just needed something to be improved. I need a skeleton. And, uh, and it was kind of liberating. So, oh, what about this and this? Add your purple stuff. Yeah, add colors, add notes, and then we can uh, improve them one by one. And, but that was really, really weird because uh, we were not expecting this, uh, this to, to happen. So, in general, yes, critics are welcome, and uh, we, we like uh, to get into demolition state. It's part of the workflow. But it's good, and it's also scary for somebody, because there's one last trick that we didn't talk about. <coughs> this one. Um, the missing link here, something that, uh, that I realized was really missing from my recipe, is this one. Now, uh, personalities, but also something deeper, which is uh, the ability of people to share incomplete reasoning or incomplete work. So every architect wants to show the, their plan, their model, once it's finished, not where it's not complete. Showing something which is not complete for somebody was just like, uh, uh, yeah, coming naked on stage. It was really something, no, you, you don't do this. And I, and I realized, like, uh, it was not a problem for me, I mean, to show something uh, not complete. You have a good example here. Uh, but, uh, but for some people, showing... Uh, uh, yeah, mixing, exposing their incomplete uh, uh, reasoning was really, really uh, a torture, not, not really a good experience. At the same time, other dynamics are really weird. So um, some people really need silence to think and come up with a solution. Some other people are thinking verbally. I mean, we had a couple of people that we dug the loudspeaker and they can only think by, by talking, and they were disrupting the train of thought of everybody else in the room. So we saw people trying to get out because they needed to think in the corridor. Um, some people are not okay at all with critics. Every, every little adjustment to their model is perceived like a, like a rebellion. Uh, we call them the unconfident. Or, the Dungeon Master, or yeah, the guy from another band. I already know this song. I know how to play this. We already model a system like this. You just do this and this and this and this. And okay, where's the fun? We just cut and paste in everything that you were doing from, uh, from a, a previous experience. In general, this is what you get. It just, uh, it's, uh, it's not easy. It's a place where you can have uh, given, uh, given helps, but at the same time, you need to use a lot of respect in order to get there. And, uh, Yes, the, the, final, the final thing here just is uh, you're losing paternity, and for somebody, that might be a problem. And uh, not for me, I really don't care about uh, who's bringing the solution as long as it works, but uh, yeah, different personalities. Some people want to be the owner of the solution, or they want to have this, uh, uh, this feeling. Um, there's little variation that we can play. Uh, we're mob modeling, sometimes when we have uh, more than uh, five people, it's better to uh, yeah, steal the idea from Woody Zool and, and have one person moving, other people commenting. You might go silent rounds. Actually, there's something that you really need, which is breaks. It's not a continuous activity. This is actually my personal fault. I love doing this, and sometimes I, I win the model by exhausting everybody else in the room. But I'm aware of that, so get out, have a coffee, have a beer, and all this stuff. 
is, uh, is part of the game, but uh, breaks are needed, fresh air, healthy food, you need sleeping. Sometimes you need to finish the model in the morning after. In this situation, you might feel like actually this baby is just like uh, dreaming aggregate names and it uh, might be <laughs> useful for, for the next day. And uh, again, I mentioned it, split and merge, sometimes the whole section just needs to be alone in order to deliver. So, conclusions, it's just, that's gonna be short. Is uh, modeling basics are just the beginnings. Knowing aggregates, knowing the color coding uh, for, uh, uh, for the things is, is your instrument, but playing music is another thing. It's just like, that's a starting point. Uh, visual and verbal symmetries can help you during the process to see something, there is a structure that, uh, that might be helpful, but the most important thing is just like, you gotta include people and personality. You're asking them to do something weird and uh, the personality thing is something to be considered. So maybe the only, the only little thing to consider is actually in one single word, uh, respect for your peers, and then you can get to, something, to do something good uh, together. That was the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And uh, if you want to know about it, uh, we set up recently a good entry point about event storming on eventstorming.com, and that's the other stuff uh, about uh, yeah, book and uh, communities and so on. Take your time. We have time for a couple of questions. Here in the front row. I'm not taking questions about my book. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask one. So. <laughs> so, no. uh, when is the next update? When is the next? Next update to the book. It's a question about the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, no comments. I did not ask it. No, well, uh, there's a little bit about it. Like, uh, I was actually uh, putting it on hold because I was writing the chapter for uh, uh, the, the 15th uh, anniversary of uh, Domain Driven Design. So there is, inside that book, there's already a chapter about extracting bounded context from, uh, uh, from big picture artifact. And it's actually, I thought it was supposed to be five, six pages. It turned out something like 24. So uh, there's a little bit of extra content in there and I will keep... Uh, That's the next stuff. update. You can Story? just put it there in your book, right? Yeah. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more, more or less. Uh, but so I don't know exactly when the next update is happening, but uh, I, I never abandoned it. It's just like uh, working without being finished. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's more or less the story. So that's the product, not the project. Yeah, that's uh, the dark side of Limpub. More questions? Wait a moment. How do you convince people to start using this if there's resistance in your company? I don't convince people. Mm. I mean, they can start. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't try to convince anybody. Just like uh, if, you, if you have the freedom to make an experiment, you do it. But you have to convince somebody to do something. Uh, well, no. no I, uh, it sounds like a joke, but I, I stopped convincing people 15 years ago. It just, I'm, I'm not here to convince anybody about doing stuff. I'm, I'm here about maybe explaining something, maybe, maybe trying to uh, um, yeah, cover some, uh, some holes and mistakes. But the moment you're convincing somebody, you're, you're already losing the battle. Because the, you have a person that doesn't know about one thing, and you're giving them the responsibility to choose about how good is one thing that they don't know. You're never going to win this argument. You just do it. So, uh, do you need permission to, to buy sticky notes? If you do, you're probably a teenager. Uh, but uh, you probably don't, don't, don't need this. I mean, you need to be in, a, in, in a, an environment where a little experiment, like uh, let's use a, a paper roll instead of a whiteboard, is possible. If you don't have this, LinkedIn is a fantastic solution. <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> But, but in general, don't try to convince people. It's just, uh, oh, no, there's one trick that, that, that is the most effective uh, uh, getting people into a modeling session. It, it's called the buffet. It just, it just put sandwiches and, and, and chips and people are coming because of the food. Oh, and by the way, you're gonna be modeling. <laughs> That's the best way. Alberto, thank you very much. It was nice to have you. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you.